In hospital wards like these, the most thorough precautions are taken to guard against the risk of infection. Premature babies and other patients under intensive care are particularly vulnerable and nearly one in ten acquires an infection during their stay. Germs, like bacteria, lurk everywhere and they're readily passed from one person to another. Whether an infection is trivial or potentially fatal, it usually requires treatment with antibiotics. But antibiotics are no longer the panacea they once were. And since their introduction over 40 years ago, many bacteria have become resistant to them. One after another, these drugs have become less effective, so limiting the options available for treatment. New drugs have to be designed to keep pace with the emergence of resistant strains. Bacteria respond quickly to new challenges and resistance spreads between species. Their secret? Bits of DNA that move genes from one bacterium to another. The emergence of resistant bacteria is related to the frequency and pattern of antibiotic use. So a careful eye is kept by doctors and microbiologists on how patients respond to treatment. It seems that clinically the most likely thing is if he's got a urinary infection because his urine is a bit, um, a bit cloudy. Is it? Yes, yes. and you did, I think, take a... We had a specimen, a specimen earlier yes. and we uh, had a look at it and it's unfortunately resistant to both ampicillin and carbenicillin. I yes, don't know what antibiotics yes, yes. is he he's, on. He's on ampicillin at the moment, yes. So I think we'd better probably have another sample with a view to selecting another antibiotic. Yes, and mm. we've got a catherine, so we can uh, get a sample for you now. Yes. If you very helpful, like to take, take a sample. Okay, okay. Right. Thanks very much. Right. Bacteria isolated from urine samples can be identified by establishing which organic compounds they grow on. Each strain is then checked for its sensitivity to a range of antibiotics. It was decided to compare bacteria in the patient's latest specimen with one taken a few weeks earlier. Oh, we've got some uh, interesting results up from the, from the technicians. Uh -huh. they, uh, these in here, right? Yes, these top two are from the old specimen, aren't they? The earlier one. I see there's a Proteus mirabilis there with quite a different biochemical profile to the Providentia stuartii he had before. Yes. And this must be the new uh, right. isolate, is it? He's, he's got a... It's P. stuartii as well. That's right, identical biotype. It's what's interesting about these is... Yeah? If you look at the sensitivities of these two, this was the original isolate. Right. And you'll notice yeah. that uh, it's sensitive to carbenicillin. It's a nice zone, isn't it? Very, very large zone of inhibition. Whereas this one, which, which appears to be the same biotype, is actually resistant and very high level resistant too. Yeah, okay. Right up to disc, isn't it? No inhibition at all. Microbiologist Peter Hawkey. It was interesting that spontaneously his Providentia stuartii became resistant to carbenicillin and ampicillin. Whereas before, isolates from the same patient, which gave the same biotype, the same species type, were sensitive. So it seemed likely that we'd had some molecular event occur here in the evolution of this resistance to carbenicillin. And we decided, therefore, to study this in greater depth. We were fortunate in having the early sensitive strain and the subsequent resistant strain. We were therefore able to compare them very closely. And indeed, they were identical, with the exception that the resistant strain was carrying some extra DNA, which seemed to be associated with this resistance phenomenon. The extra DNA wasn't carried on the bacterial chromosome that you see spilling out of the cell in this electron micrograph, but on a small piece of DNA called a plasmid. Plasmids are about 1% of the size of the chromosome. They may carry a number of genes and are often present in the cell in multiple copies. 
Because they're smaller than the chromosome, plasmids can be separated out using an ultracentrifuge. The DNA is labelled with a dye that fluoresces under ultraviolet light. The lighter plasmid DNA shows up as a narrow fluorescent band that can be siphoned off from the heavier chromosomal DNA at the bottom of the tube. Plasmid DNA is isolated from the resistant and the sensitive strain of the Providentia bacterium. The size of these plasmids can be compared with others of known size by loading samples separately onto a gel. When an electric current is applied across the gel, the plasmid DNA will separate out according to size. Small plasmids travel further down the gel than large ones and show up as fluorescent bands under UV light where they're photographed for easy reference. We were fortunate in that both strains only carry a single plasmid. I've put three size standards on. We know the sizes of these plasmids. And uh, here are the two Providencia strains. Yeah. This one is the sensitive strain, and this one's the resistance strain. You can see quite clearly that in the resistance strain, yeah. the, the single plasmid is much larger mm. than in the fully sensitive strain. When we looked at the resistance plasmid, we were expecting to see a small increase in the size of that plasmid in relation to the sensitive strains plasmid, because we were expecting that that, strain, that plasmid had acquired a small piece of DNA called a transposon, which often codes for this type of resistance, and is able to jump from one plasmid to another, taking the resistance genes with it. And the size of that small piece of DNA is around about five kilobases. When we came to analyze it, actually on the gels for sizing, we found that our resistance plasmid was some 10 kilobases bigger than the sensitive strain, which is interesting, and led us to the conclusion that perhaps there were two copies of this transposon. Their suspicions were confirmed when geneticist John Heritage compared an electron micrograph with a map of the resistant plasmid. He was able to work out the relative size and position of the two extra segments of DNA. What does that come out as? Oh yes, it's, it's very nice. It comes out as about five kilobases. So this double-stranded DNA here um, obviously fits very nicely with this double insertion of this transposon here. So that's very plasmid. good because it means our electron microscope data now fits with the restriction in yes, the that's right. net. I've measured the single-stranded pieces around here and these fit very nicely with the sizes I would expect from, from these sequences. Yeah. What we've got is, is two copies of a transposon. The presence of two identical transposons showed up in the electron micrograph. This picture shows one strand of the normally double-stranded plasmid that after separation has been allowed to reassociate two single-stranded loops are joined in the middle by a double-stranded stem that is the length of one transposon but the thickness of two. For the transposons to come together, their bases must complement each other. So that adenine can pair with thymine and guanine with cytosine. And this is because the position of the two transposons in the plasmid are inverted with respect to each other. Such loop and stem structures are also formed by single-stranded plasmid DNA carrying only one transposon. In this case, it's because the ends of the transposon have matching bases. If we look at these ends in a complete double-stranded plasmid, we'll see why. The sequence of bases on one side are inverted but complementary to the other side. These inverted repeats are important for the transposon to move to another molecule because they're recognized and cut by a special enzyme called transposase, coded for by the transposon itself. But what determines how and when a transposon moves? 
Dave Sherratt at the University of Glasgow is trying to find out. The transposases that are encoded by transposons almost certainly recognize the end of the transposon and make breaks there. These same enzymes also recognize and break the target, the point at which the transposon is going to insert. A part of our own research at the moment is trying to elucidate the precise mechanism by which these proteins recognize the ends of the transposon, bring them together, and cut the target site so the transposon can insert into the new site. There's very little growth at all. Is there any growth there, do you think? No. Well, I can't see any. There might be some coming up. We're now using modern recombinant DNA and protein engineering techniques to alter the structure of the transposon ends and the structure of the protein. Ultimately, we hope to be in a position in which we can reconstruct the whole transposition process in the test tube. When a transposon moves from one DNA molecule to another, the target site is cleaved in a characteristic way. Insertion of the transposon generates staggered breaks in the target DNA. The stagger can be several bases long. The transposon is joined to the broken ends and enzymes repair the single-stranded gaps. In this way, direct repeats are generated in the target DNA flanking either end of the transposon. By jumping to a new site then, a transposon brings about a number of changes in DNA structure, so it's important to know how often such an event occurs. There are many different ways of measuring the rate of transposition. One is to measure the rate of inactivation of a particular gene. One convenient way is to take a bacterium that is lactose plus. It can utilize the sugar lactose. If a transposon inserts into the gene that is required for lactose utilization, then the bacterium will become lac minus. We can easily assay for this using a color test on plates. By putting a particular chemical into petri dishes, cells that are lac plus can utilize lactose are blue. Cells that become lac minus become white. And so we can start with a culture that is lac plus, gives blue colonies. We can introduce our transposon on the plasmid, and that we can now look at the frequency of white, that is lac minus colony. We now can take such white colonies and from them isolate the plasmid containing the lac gene and ask, has the transposon inserted into it? In the normal situation, though transposition is rare in a cell that is growing happily and in which a transposon has been long established, it is known that there are certain situations in which transposition occurs at high frequency. For example, when a transposon enters a cell on a plasmid, often there is a burst of transposition. It's as if the transposon wants to jump, wants to proliferate quicker. Similarly, in cells that are stressed in certain ways, transposition occurs at relatively high rates. For example, in cells that are starved or stored at low temperature, there seems to be a much higher rate of transposition than normal. The lesion of what's happening here. Well, I think that what's happening here is that under the selection we're losing the plasma. Ultimately, we really need to get at the natural history of transposons. Why are they transposing at particular frequencies in cells? What determines this? Why is it at the level it is? And really, what are the consequences? But what can this tell us about how bacteria suddenly acquire resistance to several antibiotics at once? Of course, if a transposon carries antibiotic resistance, then by moving from one place to another, plasmids and chromosomes can acquire new antibiotic resistance genes. Because transposons often jump from one plasmid to another, it means that plasmids can acquire new combinations of antibiotic resistance, and antibiotic resistance genes can be shuffled from one plasmid to another. So a plasmid might acquire a transposon carrying resistance for penicillin and another for tetracycline. But if it were to pick up another copy of the penicillin transposon, 
then an interesting situation arises. All three transposons can, as usual, move independently. But because the same enzyme cuts the ends of both penicillin transposons, it's possible for the segment of DNA in between them to move on block. In this way, a new, larger transposon is created. And if the DNA in between is also carrying another gene, say for chloramphenicol resistance, then the new transposon will carry multiple resistance for two different antibiotics. For multiple resistance to spread to other bacteria, there needs to be an exchange of DNA between cells. And plasmids are often exchanged during mating or conjugation. So have plasmids been the main vehicles for the spread of antibiotic resistance? Our answer can be found here at Collindale Public Health Laboratories in a collection of bacteria that date back to the pre-antibiotic era. The collection, started by Naomi Data, is being continued by Vicky Hughes. Gradually we're transferring your cultures into this freeze-dried form in ampoules. Um, the advantage of this is that the bacteria are dry and they can keep for over 30 years in, in some cases. But also they occupy very, very little space for the large numbers of bacteria that we have in here. Yes, it's very economical in space. I can mm. see you've got some of our old cultures here in our old bottles. Yes, of course, these took a, lot, took a lot more space. Yes, of course they did. So how did Naomi first become interested in antibiotic-resistant bacteria? As new antibiotics were introduced into medicine, bacteria resistant to those new antibiotics started appearing. And it turned up that the new resistances were also transmissible from one bacterium to another. With hindsight, we can say that plasmids were acquiring new antibiotic resistance genes, but at the time we just saw what was happening. And so I made a big collection of all kinds of different bacteria with different antibiotic resistances. And then we wanted to classify these um, resistance factors, they were called then, now they're called plasmids, resistance plasmids. And the way we classified them was by incompatibility. This means that two very closely related plasmids won't coexist in a bacterial culture. So by testing a group of plasmids, each one against all the others, you can put them into groups according to whether or not they coexist. And by doing this, we discovered that we had, ooh, a lot of different groups. And then the next question we asked was, are these all completely different creatures? Have they all evolved separately? But the funny thing was, you could find the same antibiotic resistance, the actual same gene, determined by plasmids of different groups. Well, this was already indication that the antibiotic resistance genes could transpose from one position to another. We didn't know where these transposable antibiotic resistance genes came from, but we thought we might find out something about the plasmids. We wondered whether they'd always been there. And very luckily, just then, we were able to get hold of a collection of bacteria which had been started in 1916, long before antibiotics came in. That they had been collected by Professor Murray, and he had um, preserved them in a very simple way. He'd simply had bacterial cultures in test tubes, sealed off the Bunsen flame. We set about classifying them in the same way that we did our antibiotic resistance plasmids. And we found that nearly all the Murray plasmids belonged to the same groups, that is, they were related to the ones that we are finding nowadays among hospital and other bacteria. So it looks as if these plasmids had been there in bacteria from time immemorial, at least from 1916, but presumably much longer than that. And after antibiotics were introduced into medicine, they acquired new DNA encoding antibiotic resistances, one after the other. By following patterns of antibiotic resistance in plasmids, it's possible to trace the movement and evolution of resistance genes. So plasmid libraries, like the one at Collindale, provide a useful source for reference and research. Naomi's collection was built up over a 25-year period, but not all her 
strains have been characterized by modern day methods. So a lot of our work is, is devoted to backtracking a little bit and characterizing her strains by more modern techniques, particularly looking at the plasmid DNA itself, its molecular weight and its molecular structure. Gradually, we're grouping all this information together and holding it on a microcomputer database. This is the main menu of the plasmid database. I ask it for R1, and it produces this screen with oh, the information we have at the moment. Yes. Yes. So for instance, this is the bacterium from which R1 first came, Salmonella pyrotypi. It tells us the molecular weight of the plasmid, 62 megadaltons, that it's self-transmissible, and that it contains two transposons, TN3 and TN4. If I move on to the next screen about the plasmid R1, it tells me the incompatibility group, INC F2, and further on, the literature reference to your original publication about plasmid oh, R1. Oh, that's very nice. Yes. And then finally, the, the antibiotic resistance history. We can store a vast amount of information about diverse types of plasmids. We also hope that our computer will help us to respond to inquiries from people who use our strains to provide information on the plasmids we hold and also to be able to guide them to the sort of plasmids they may wish to use in their studies. For instance, people inquire about the molecular weights of plasmids if they want to type the plasmid content of a bacterial strain. They ask us about resistance genes contained in plasmids because they may want to compare new resistance genes with ones that have already been characterized. The majority of Nairn's collection has already been freeze-dried and put into the ampules. And in the future, we shall continue this process because the ampule storage allows us to keep bacteria in good condition for a very long period of time. Bacteria can remain stable in the freeze-dried form for over 30 years. And so there's an element of conservation in the work that we do. In preserving Nairn's bacteria for the future, we don't know what uses will be made of those plasmid-bearing strains in 30 or 40 years' time. After all, Murray had no idea at all when he stored his strains that they may be used to answer questions on the evolution of antibiotic resistance in hospitals. And so it's for bacterial geneticists of the future to use the strains laid down by us over these next few years to answer questions that possibly haven't even been thought of.